You know what I find funny? Maybe it's just me, but I think the silent treatment is hilarious. <laughs> because like, here's the, here, here's the, the idea. I'm, I'm mad at you, so to punish you, I'm not going to talk to you. Okay, if you're mad at me, thank you for not talking to me. I don't, want, I don't want you to talk to me when you're mad, you know what I'm saying? So now, ladies, because I care, I want to just give you a little piece of advice. The silent treatment might not be your most effective weapon of arbitration with your male significant other. Because it could take like two days before he even notices Right? And it's not, it's not that we're just inferior human beings. Okay, so it's a little bit of that. But the fact is, men are more comfortable with silence than you might imagine. So take two women, put them in a car, they drive for an hour. If they go an hour without saying a single word to each other, <sighs> right? I mean, there's a problem. You take two guys, put them in a car, they drive for an hour, they don't say a word, we call that friendship. <laughs> we can actually go through an entire NFL football game, and though we will produce sounds, guys feel no, like, necessary urge to complete a coherent sentence. Dude, this is the way we are. So, ladies, probably don't expect us to respond well to the silent treatment. It might actually be a welcome reprieve. Guys, if you are getting <laughs> the silent treatment, you probably need to figure out what she's saying to you. Oh, I don't know what she's saying. She ain't saying nothing. She's not talking to me. No, listen, son. She's always talking to you especially when she's silent. Ladies on each of our campus, can I get a witness? <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're trying to tell you something important you need to listen. So to help you out, guys, I've actually I've composed a poem. It's short. You're welcome. Here it is. When her hands are on her hips, ain't no need to move her lips. <laughs> Ladies, Amen. She's saying to you that something really important, you just need to figure it out. Well, that's a problem. I know, it's, it's hard to figure out what someone's saying when they're not talking, but if you get that concept that a woman is always talking to you even if she's not using words, apply that to God. Because often, God is not using words, but God is always, always speaking. And I suppose that this is a good time to bring it up. It's kind of a, a different week between Christmas and New Year's, you know. Things quiet down quickly, and sometimes we get to reflecting on the year to come, and we ask the question, what is God saying to me in the silence? That's, that's what I want to answer in this message. And I don't know that I'm smart enough to answer it myself, so I got a group of Christians that I respect. We got in a room together, and we just, we look through the Bible at all the times that God was silent, and we asked the question, what is God trying to say to us in the silence? H have you ever been there, the silence of God? Where you pray to God and nothing. I mean, not a yes, not a no, not a wait, just silence. So you open up the Bible and you re plow through a few verses or maybe a few chapters and you're saying, God, I'm listening here. It is God's word. You expect him to speak, but sometimes it never penetrates your heart. Or, or you come to a service at CCV and, and you look at people on your right, you look at people on your left, they're being moved by the message and the music, but nothing. What do you do when God is silent? What is he trying to say to you? I want to suggest three things that God says in the silence from the Bible. Number one, often when God is silent, he's saying, the, silent, the, the, the silence of God sometimes says, sit down. And, and when the, God's silence says, sit down, it's because we need stillness. If we don't have stillness, it's very hard to listen carefully to what another person is saying. Guys, have you ever been at a sports a bar with your wife and you're trying to listen to her while the game's going on? It's very, very difficult. We have these distractions in our lives, and what better time than now to talk about it? Look, we've been running and gunning since Black Friday of 2008. 
and we're just plowing through life and we don't slow down long enough to listen carefully to what God is saying to us. Psalm chapter 46 verse 10 says this, be still and know that I am God. We're so busy right now, here's a fact, the average married couple in America spends two minutes a day in meaningful conversation. And the average parent spends 30 seconds a day with his kid in meaningful conversation. Look, if you can't spend more than two minutes or 30 seconds talking to the people you care about the most, you are, in fact, too busy. I mean, this is a message that God embedded in the very first story of the Bible. On the seventh day of creation, God rested. Why? Because he was tired? No, because he wants to set a precedent for those of us that love to run in fifth gear all the time. We, it's, it's as difficult as ever to try to find this stillness to hear the voice of God. A guy named Job knew all about this. Job, spelled like Job, a whole book of the Old Testament, you can read his story, but to cut to the chase, Job lost everything. He, he lost his house, his herds, his flocks, his, his, his crops, even his children were killed. Devastated and sitting in sickness, scraping his scabs with broken pieces of pottery, Job's friends show up, about the only thing he didn't lose were these friends, who come to not console him, but interrogate him. He said, Job, what, uh, what, what did you do to make God so mad? And Job says, honestly, nothing. I've got no secret sin. They said, no, just confess your sin and God will change his mind and change your situation. Job goes, seriously, I did nothing against God. And it, tired of all of their inappropriate criticism, Job says something, I love this, chapter 13, verse 5. If only, he says this to his friends, if only you would be altogether silent. For you, that would be wisdom. <laughs> Are there any teenagers here? No, I just <laughs> would be helpful. Anyway, Job should have listened to his own advice. Chapter 31, he shakes his fist at God in frustration. Tired of being tired. Sick of being sick. He said, God, I've done nothing to you, and if you would just let me have a conversation with you, I would explain my case. You would relent and return my fortunes. God, you're not listening to me. Job should rather have sat in silence because two chapters later, God does show up and gives Job a chance to talk. Here's what God says. I want to read this passage to you. Chapter 33 Verse 31, pay attention, O Job, listen to me, be silent, and I will speak. I think if God is not speaking, part of the problem is that we are not listening because we don't have margin built into our life to even have the luxury of listening to God. I, I, I read last week that in the last 20 years, we are working as Americans 15% more hours than we worked 20 years ago. And that leaves us with 33% less leisure time than we've ever had. A guy by the name of Swenson in his 2000 book simply entitled Margin made this incredible observation. Have you ever looked at a really old book, like 100 years old? And you see it's a small print and it goes, it goes right to the margin of the page. You know why they did that? Because paper was valuable, and they wanted to squeeze as many words on a page as they could. But now you look at, a, at a, a book, and you'll see more margin on the edge of the page. Why? Because what's more valuable than paper is your attention. And when you have really small print, and it goes to the margin, your eyes get tired, and you read fewer words, and you comprehend what you read less. That's a metaphor for all of our lives. When we pack our lives so full of speech and so full of sound and so full of activity, we don't have any margin left. We don't have margin in our budget to be generous. We don't have margin in our time to sit and listen to other people's stories. We don't have margin in our day for physical exercise, so we go to bed exhausted and out of shape. Without margin, we are less effective. And so what we need, the solution is that we find a clutch. Now, I didn't say to find neutral, because neutral, I don't like neutral. 
Neutral is when the car's running, but you're not. And for a guy, I'm a run and gunning kind of guy. I got things to do, places to go, people to see. When I'm in neutral, it's just frustrating. But a clutch, I've always loved to drive a stick, right? You, you go from one gear, and then you push on the clutch to disengage the engine. Not because you're resting, but because you're ready to go to a higher gear. God didn't embed rest in the Bible so that you would be ineffective, but so that you would be more productive. He gives us these moments and these seasons where we can just power down for a little bit so that when we re-engage, we are more effective than we were before. So finding a clutch is another way of talking about building margin into your life. Okay, but how do we actually do that? I want to show you a couple of uh, charts here. The first one is how the average working American spends his or her hours during the work week. Five days a week, here's the chart. If you will look at the red portion, leisure and sports, 2.6 hours a day are spent in leisure and sports. Now, obviously, more than that is spent on the weekend in leisure and sports. But we should just say leisure, because there's not a lot of sports involved in that. You know why? There is a single activity that dominates the bulk of Americans' free time, and it is television. On average, four hours a day, not only the five days of this chart, but also the two days of the weekend. That is an unbelievable amount of time. Now, now maybe a lot of it is just the TV's on and we're working in the background, but still, you're going to get distracted by the noise. If there's too much background noise, you can't have a serious conversation with God, especially a God who likes to whisper. And you might think, well, those darn kids, they're the ones jacking up the, uh, the hours of watching TV because they're always watching TV. Actually, that's not true. You know who watches most TV? Uh, look at this chart. Over on the left, you're going to see uh, 10 to 11-year-olds. Uh, then you're going to have uh, 12 to 17-year-olds, 18 to 24. As it goes up, you, you notice the second to the left is 50 to 64-year-olds. When we are supposed to be plowing into our career, when we have children of our own, some in that age, grandchildren, you're supposed to be working really hard and all that busyness, but in fact, those are the, that is the group that is watching the most television per day. Now, I'm not against you watching television. It's a decent leisure activity, but not at three and a half, four hours a day. I think we would all agree on that. So what is an actual step we can take that would practically build margin into our lives. I want to introduce you to a book. It's called Eat That Frog. It's a great title. Don't have time to explain it. But Brian Tracy, in that book, offers one time management principle I would like to baptize as Christians. He says that those who spend 10 minutes in the morning planning their day can actually recover as much as two hours in the day of time they would have wasted otherwise. What if we, for the next 30 days, because that's how long it takes to build a habit, would you take up this challenge that for 30 days, every morning you would spend 10 minutes with your to-do list laid in front of God? I mean, it's, you don't have to figure out these fancy prayers. You don't have to ha be some super spiritual person. Just, hey, God, here's what I got on my day. 10 o'clock, doctor's appointment. 2 o'clock, picking up my kid from school. 5 o'clock, dinner with a friend. If you would look at your day with God every morning, I, I can't prom make promises for God, but I bet you at the end of 30 days, you would hear him say, this item on the list, not my priority. Might be yours, not mine. This item on the list, you probably need to add it at the very top of your list. That item, get rid of it. You don't need to do that at all. I, I just bet that if you built margin into your life so that you were quiet long enough, you would hear God speak to you clearly. Sometimes God's silence says, sit down. Sometimes God's silence says, not now. When God's silence says, not now, it's because we need consistency. So thinking about this message, I, I went through the Bible and just wondered, how often does God actually speak? Like in the Bible, how often does God speak? 
The, the Bible covers 4,000 years of human history, from Genesis to Revelation. And if you took all the prophets, all the kings, all the apostles, Jesus, John the Baptist, everyone that God spoke to, added up their lifespans, you would get 1,000 years. That, that's like 25% of the Bible God speaks. The other times, there are long periods of silence. For 430 years, Israel, were, they were slaves in Egypt. God said nothing. Between the last book of the Old Testament and the first book of the New, another 450 years, silence. For Moses, you, you got 40 years where he's a shepherd in the wilderness. God is silent. The silence of God should not surprise you. It, it in fact, is more common than God speaking. So what is he saying when he says, not now? Typically, God is saying, I have a desert that I want you to walk through. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but there's a lot of deserts in the Bible. And, and, and most of the people that God cared about, most of the heroes in the pages of Scripture walked through a desert. Abraham did. David ran from Saul in the desert. Moses led God's people for 40 years in the desert. Jesus was tempted in the desert. John the Baptist lived in the desert. The apostle Paul was trained in the desert. Deserts are great places, not to hear God, but to see him. Because when you're in a desert, maybe your desert is a, a physical illness that you've asked God, I, I sure would like you to heal me, and he says, not yet. Or maybe you've got a child that is wayward, you grieve over that child, and God says, not yet. Maybe you're lonely. You're single or single again. You're going through this desert, and you're saying, God, could you just speak to me? And he says, not yet. There's all kind of deserts that we find ourselves in, and if you feel dry and thirsty for the voice of God, please hear me say this. The silence of God seldom equates to the absence of God. And the funny thing about the desert is, though you don't see God, you, or don't hear God, you will see God in the desert, not through the windshield, through the rearview mirror. And as you start passing through the desert, coming to the other side of the desert, and you look in the rearview mirror, you say, wow, God was with me all along. Deserts are difficult places, and so what's the solution when you find yourself in a desert? It is to find a gear. Any gear, I don't care, second gear, fourth gear, it doesn't matter. Find a gear and just stick with it. Do what you know is right to hear the voice of God. What, what, what might that look like? Well, for one thing, pray. Just because God is silent doesn't mean that we should be. Keep talking to him about what's on your heart, about the dreams that you have. Keep, go ahead and complain to him about his silence. Job did, it's okay, he might show up. Just be careful what you ask for. That when you're in a desert, you need to make sure that you're still in the word. Because this, this is God's word, and he speaks to us through this. And it, you might go a day or two reading the Bible and not hearing much from God, but I doubt you go a month I know you won't go a year. God gave this to us so that when he is silent, you would still have a guide to go by in your life. Read the Bible. Come to church. This is a place where you meet other Christians. Go to your neighborhood group. Be faithful to be gathered around other believers. Here's why. Now, I can't prove this scientifically, but what I've noticed is the voice of God often echoes off of other people. And if you will posture yourself next to people who are hearing the voice of God, eventually you'll hear the echo of God from their life to yours. If we're consistent, just find a gear so that you can continue in the habits that are the right places to hear the voice of God. Eventually, ollie ollie oxen free, he'll come out. Sometimes, God's silence says, not now. And sometimes God's silence simply says, no. I'm not going to give you what you asked for. Why? When God says no, it's because we need acceptance. 
We need to accept the will of God for our lives and know that our God has our best interest in mind. This God who flung universes into space like he was finger painting cares about you. He knows what is not just best for you, but best through you. He's going to use your life for his greatest glory, whether you like it or not. The question is not if God will say no to you. The real question that interests me is, to whom does God say no? Because maybe you've cried out to God and said, God, I I sure would like to have a baby. And you get into your 30s, 40s, there's no baby. God, I I sure sure would like to have a spouse. And and, and you get into your 30s, no spouse. God, I'd sure like to have a job that I could take care of my family, to buy them the things that they need or sometimes the things they want. I, I, that would be great. Could you, could you get me that better job? God, I sure would like to not hurt anymore. And if God says no, you just need to ask, whose company are you in? I find in the Bible four different people to whom God says no. Moses. I mean, he's a, a big hero, right? He led Israel through the wilderness, but never himself went into the promised land. God let him stand on Mount Nebo, looking into the land flowing with milk and honey, but when it came time to go in, God says, no, Joshua is going to lead them in, not you. I, I remember David asked God, God, I would love to build a temple for you, because all, of, all that you've done for me, I want to honor you among the nations. God said, mm, no, that's going to be for your son Solomon. You've got too much bloodshed on your hands from your wars. No, no, you can't build the temple, Solomon will. He begged him, no. Paul, the great apostle and evangelist, went all over the Mediterranean preaching the gospel. He had a thorn in his flesh, whatever that was. I, personally, I think it was probably blindness. The heart, he couldn't see much anymore. We're reading those scrolls, and his eyes are getting dark. And he says, God, I, I want you to take this away from me. I want you to heal me so that I don't have to suffer with this thorn in the flesh anymore. And God said, no. In fact, Paul records, he said, I asked God three different times, take this away. No. Please, take it. No. God, I'm just begging you. No. Why? Jesus, night before he died, kneeling in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, take this cup away from me. No. I'm going to ask you again, God, please, I don't, I don't want to die on a cross, whatever, but your will be done, not mine. And God says, no, because it's my will for you to die for the sins of the world. God, I'm asking you a third time, please take this cup away from me. And God said, no, no, no. Who does God say no to? It's not people he doesn't like. It's people he trusts to bear a heavy load so that someone else, somewhere down the road, would be relieved of their burden. And if God has said no to you for a child, or for your health, or for a job, or for anything else, and you're feeling like, God, you you let me down. No, God hasn't let you down. He's built you up and put you in a place where your witness for him can be a great story for others to read. There's a lot of people around here at CCV that just... I'm so impressed with. Some of them are on staff, and they do such a great job, but a lot of the people I'm most impressed with are just people who volunteer around here, people that you see just in the shadows. One of our members, uh, his name is Daryl Kubak. He comes to CCV at the Peoria campus, uh, usually on Saturday night, and you'll recognize him by his biceps. The dude is an absolute stud. Got a great big smile on his face, loves God, uh, but if you want to look him in the eye, you got to get on your knees, because Daryl has been in a wheelchair since 1993. He was stationed at Fort Knox in the military and got in a, was an awful, debilitating motorcycle accident. He was thrown from the bike, fell on his back, broke his back, was paralyzed actually from the chest down. Didn't stop the duty. He became a downhill skier as a paraplegic. And he was, like, the guy's an adrenaline junkie, actually broke his back again as a paraplegic. (laughs) I've never met any paraplegic who broke his back, like, twice. That's 
unbelievable. He also, this is unbelievable, 2008, climbed Kilimanjaro. That's incredible. But I think the most impressive thing about Daryl, aside from his infectious smile, is he loves God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He doesn't belittle God for putting him in a wheelchair. In fact, Daryl would tell you in 1993, he was a nominal Christian. He's, he's nothing nominal now. Last year, he joined a group of other cyclists on a, on a ride, a 207-mile ride to raise funds for a mission organization in Mexico. He did that with a bike that he pedals with his arms. I, I would love for you to meet Daryl, but you've got Daryls in your life, don't you? People to whom God said no, and instead of becoming bitter, they became better. Instead of saying, God, why? They said, what now? Instead of losing their dreams, they got different dreams to glorify God, even if God doesn't glorify their bodies. So if you find yourself today at a time when God is silent because he's saying no, it may be because he respects you enough to trust you with a burden that others cannot bear. So what's the solution? It is to find crews. Sometimes when you're on a long, dry stretch of road, you just hit the cruise and you let her ride because you know you need to settle in because it's going to be a long drive from here. And maybe you've got a long drive ahead of you with a family member or with a child, with a job or with a spouse. And you just, God's calling you to hit cruise, to settle in for the long. How do you actually do that? I want to make three suggestions. These are not in your notes, but maybe you could scribble them on the side. If you're going to cruise effectively, number one, you adjust your expectations. Life is going to be different from here on out. This car accident or this doctor's visit or this new child, this adoption, it's going to change everything. And so you have to not downgrade your expectations, but to adjust to reality of what this is really going to look like from here on out. Number two, you have to trade in your dreams. I, I didn't say abandon your dreams, but you trade one for another. You might trade success for significance. You might trade fame for, for being spiritually solid. You might, you might trade being in the limelight to being in the shadows, but your dreams are to glorify God. Third, you need to re reinforce your resolve because when God says no, sometimes it's just a long road. And there won't be, there will be plenty of days where God doesn't speak to you. In fact, I'll tell you, in the Bible, God spoke 25% of the time. That would be a very high estimate for me. I don't hear God every day. I don't hear God every week. Sometimes I will go a month or two, sometimes three or six, before I hear God's voice. For me, that changes nothing. Because I'm not faithful to God because of what I hear today. I'm faithful to God because what he did 2,000 years ago. It's not my rear view, it's not my, it's not my windshield that drives me, it's the rear view mirror. I know that God was faithful to me. So if God never speaks to me again, till the day I die, I will still speak for him. Because he's true, he's right, and he's real. So what's your takeaway? If you feel like, man, God's been awful quiet lately, Maybe it's because you need to find a, find a clutch and you need to disengage long enough so that God can speak into your life. For others, it's, you just need to find a gear. that God has asked you to do some things and you've said, it's not God that said not now, it's you said not now. And maybe you need to re-engage with what God has already told you so that he can really have a, a word in your life. Or for some of you, God said no, and you, need to, you just need to set crews and be faithful to God for as long as this will last. Look, I, I know that many of you are hearing God right now, and many of you are not. I, I read this. I want to share it as kind of a closing idea. When God speaks, you reap. When God's silent, you sow. Look, if God's speaking to you now, good for you. I'm happy for you. It's, it's, it's a great time when God speaks. It, it's wonderful to hear his word. But reaping doesn't last forever. There will come a season of sowing. 
And if you are in a season right now where God just has gone dark, I assure you, he will speak again. But right now, you need to sow. Plant in your life the disciplines that when God speaks again, you will have a great harvest to reap. Let's pray. Holy Father, speak, for your servants are listening. Here we are, arms open wide, ears open wide. Speak. If you tell us to wait, we'll wait. If you tell us no, we will accept it. If you tell us to find a gear, we will be disciplined with that. But God, speak to us as a church so that we can carry out your will in this valley. Here we are, listening. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.